Hi guys and welcome to Radwolf and Bushcraft. Today I'm going to address a topic that concerns all of us, no matter if we're out there bushcrafting, if we're just wild camping or just taking a hike out in the forest. And as you could see in the description, this is about ticks and also the diseases that you can spread and the entire topic around protection and prevention of these diseases. So why am I doing this video if there's so much information out there? Well, exactly that's the point. There is a lot of information out there and a lot of that information is not scientifically proven. There's a lot of make-believe, there's a lot of urban legends and there's a lot of tips out there that are not beneficial to you but are very very dangerous and can lead to very severe consequences for you and your health. So I'm trying to compose kind of like an ultimate tick guide here that is based on scientific truths I will also mention those sources in the links in the description so you should check that out and just have a look at that to educate yourself so if you want to learn something about this topic please come with me watch this video to the end and off we go okay so let's first talk about the taxonomy and the behavior of the tick as such I would like to make a distinction between the two main families that we know which are the Exodidae, the hard ticks, probably you've seen those before, and the Argazidae, the soft ticks. I'm just going to take a couple of notes here that I made just to give you the proper information. We have to distinguish these two families in the sense that the Exodidae are the hard ticks with this very well-known hard type of body shell which then basically opens up so that the back part of the body of the tick can expand while it's sucking blood. The soft ticks are a variety that don't have this protection, they are completely soft and in total those two families add up to about 800 to 900 species. In general ticks are arachnidae, which means they are spider-like creatures. We're going to focus on the deer tick today, which is also known as the Ixodes capularis. I will show you a picture right now. The reason why I want to focus on this type of tick is because it's probably the most common here in Western Europe. You probably have seen it before and there are a lot of other varieties that could be addressed but do have the like a comparable life cycle or almost the same life cycle as this tick. One might think of the dog tick for example. So about the life cycle, how does a tick live and reproduce itself? It's pretty simple. You got eggs from this egg stage they turn into larvae, the first stage they reach, then into nymphs, and then from nymphs into adult ticks that basically reproduce again, lay eggs, and the cycle starts over again. For the deer tick, this is a two-year life cycle, meaning that in the first year, the larvae hatch, turn into the nymphs, then we pass the winter time, and then in the next year, they will turn into the adults and reproduce again. There are also ticks that have a three-year life cycle and if it comes to the soft ticks that we just discussed those soft ticks do have up to seven nymph states in between so there's also a difference here. Why is this so important to understand? Ticks do feast before every state which means that for every state they want to reach they have to take in a blood meal from a host drop off develop into the next stage and then get back onto another host to suck more blood. Also then about the habitat for ticks, if you take a look around right here, this would be the habitat of the tick because we do have leaves on the ground like a leaf sheet that is covering it, they live there, there's grass growing and weeds so they also do live in there. Back there we got a bit of backwoods with twigs and ferns, also a very ideal area for ticks to breed, keep that in mind. So about the behavior of the tick, what does a tick do and why does it do what it does and what do we need to take care of? Well, first of all, ticks are ectoparasites, meaning that they attach to the outer side of a host, to the skin basically. If we take a look at the deer tick, that becomes quite apparent because it's called deer tick as far as deer is a carrier for these type of ticks. But there's also a misconception that only deer do carry the deer tick. Actually, rodents and birds and also humans do so too. The same accounts for dogs, for example, if you go out on a walk with your dog. 
and especially in the smaller stages so if they are larvae and nymph they tend to search for tinier hosts hosts that are omnipresent because if we take a look around this territory here there's a lot of mice there's also rats because we got a lake right over there and they actively search for this type of host to attach to it to use it as a mean of transport and also its means of yeah obtaining nutrients by sucking blood this is very important because if we want to protect ourselves we have to understand that ticks are kind of like everywhere there's regions in which they are not that present but they technically could be everywhere in this ground here so what does the tick do in order to get to that particular host if we take a look at that twig here or maybe one of those grass leaves down there they just climb up up onto the tip and then they spread out their so-called tarsus which is the upper pair of legs and basically the end part like my hands here and they would just sit there and wait for a host to pass by and then get onto that host hold onto him and then basically attach so how does a tick do this well a tick does not smell its host like we would smell some kind of odor this is one common misconception because ticks don't have a nose and they're not actively going around sniffing for their hosts but what they do instead is they have the so-called Haller organ named after Dr. Haller and this organ is also in the tarsus which can be yeah, regarded as this part of my hand basically there's a cavity in the, the upper part of the legs just right here and if they are lurking like this they can feel different types of molecules in the air just by that organ and some of those compounds would be carbon dioxide which is in your breath it could be sulfur compounds ammonia compounds phenoleum compounds just different types of chemicals that you exert by sweating by breathing and every other animal also basically sends out into the air by just sweating transpiring and breathing it's very important to understand this for the prevention later on but I will get to this in a second um, what's also very important to know ticks do not jump off trees it's not that they are sitting right up here and just jump onto my head and then attach to my head this does not happen it's also a misconception that it's only female ticks that do attach to a host very important to understand is that both males and females do attach to hosts it is the female that needs the bigger blood meal before she lays eggs but male ticks that are in the adult stage also still do attach they do not particularly suck blood but they need to stay on the host in order to find the female to reproduce so get that thought out of your head that it's only female ticks that do attach to a host it's just not true also about the jumping ticks again there is one variety actually which um, is in Australia if I'm right but this is not of importance for us now if we talk about the Western European area basically and yeah I think this covers everything from there we can do the next step and basically go get to the diseases that they spread and have a look at that as you might know ticks do carry diseases and this is why we make this video here I want you to understand something and that's that ticks do carry bacteria but also viruses and also protozoa so there's a variety of pathogens that can cause a variety of diseases it's not just that you get borreliosis there's even more to that some diseases you might get is the Colorado tick fever not applying for this area here because we're not in Colorado there's the Q fever there's also a paralysis phenomenon or like a paralysis disease that is caused by an Australian tick not by means of pathogens but based on its own venom so that's also interesting to note there's also the early summer meningoencephalitis for example which we will also address so please do some research there and check for your own region what sort of tick might carry which type of disease so you can anticipate and then also take measures against that really important just call your local health services or call your doctor and get yourself educated before you get out it's really important I want to talk about the two most common diseases here which is Borreliosis and the early summer meningoencephalitis 
which I will just call FSME from here on because that's the German abbreviation. So if you hear me say FSME, it is the meningoencephalitis. About the borreliosis, well, borreliosis as such is a bacterial disease and it cannot be prevented by any sort of vaccination. What you can do though is apply a treatment once you already are infected, which is an issue because you would have to take a lot of antibiotics and there's no guarantee at all that this cure will be successful. And let me tell you the story of a friend of mine. She used to go horseback riding when she was a little child and she has been bitten by a tick and, and as a result she got Lyme disease or borreliosis and her life is really miserable. She's dependent on a wheelchair, just on very specific days when she's just a little better she can manage to step out of the bed herself and sit in the wheelchair, otherwise she needs assistance. She is in constant pain due to this um, yeah, particular disease and what's also really really bad about this is that she has a paralysis of her left cheek, basically the left side of her face is paralyzed and looks as if she had a stroke. And she's at the age of 23. So for her this has a very huge impact in her life, not only by means of logistics and just living her life as she wants to, because she can't even ride horses anymore, but also because people are judging her, they're wondering what's wrong with that girl, and for her it has a very severe psychological impact. Luckily she is alive, because she could have died. This is also a thing, you know, you need to understand that Borreliosis can be potentially life-threatening. So this ain't no fun. Don't trust in any kind of esoteric remedies that people advocate, but consult your doctor and make sure that you get some quality information from a scientist, because there is a science behind this. Research that and make sure you're properly educated. Not by Wikipedia, not by blogs, but by medicinal professionals, okay? That said, let's go to the FSME. Also a very bad disease. As it's viral, you can prevent it by vaccination. So I would urge you to get vaccinated. If you are an opponent of vaccinations, think about the following. I do have that vaccination and I know about 20 other people that have been vaccinated. The only side effect is that you're kind of like down for a couple of days and we are protected from that disease. There are individuals that are not vaccinated and then basically get an infection in the outer layer of their brain, the skin. And I will give you the name in the subtitles here because I just can't come up with it right now. But what basically happens is you get an infested cerebral tissue part right here and then you die. So. Why don't you get vaccinated? What is the reason that you decide to not take preventive measures? Think about that and think about the situation you could get in if you get infected. Because if you do, there will be no more cure. It's very hard to treat FSME, the encephalitis. It's almost impossible to do so. So very important also do some research there. Contact your doctor and get quality information and make sure that you get vaccinated against that disease, okay? If you don't want to, I cannot force you, but I would also like to give you more strategies and certain tips that will help you prevent bites and if you get bitten, help you to remove a tick properly and take the proper aftercare. So if we should, let's move on to that point, right? So you have done your research, you talked to your doctor and you got yourself vaccinated. Before you go out, I would recommend to you to reach out to your local forest administration to get some more information. Because every national park in the world and every forest administration can give you detailed numbers on the risks of ticks in this area, the risk of encephalitis or the risk of borreliosis. Just send an email or call them. It's for free. You get this information and you can anticipate properly. But nevertheless, we go out into the forest and we enter the tick country. Don't panic, because there's a lot of things you can do in order to make sure that you prevent tick bites. The first thing is learning how to read the territory. I already told you that all of this type of underwood 
growth and also ferns and such are a hotspot for ticks. Just avoid that for whenever possible, basically. Also make sure that you start learning about trekking. Because if you do see deer trails and resting places of deer, you can avoid them. Those are hot spots because if deer is sleeping there, ticks drop off in that very area or are brushed off. And so there's also a hotspot for ticks. Try to stay on main trails if you're hiking or walking. Try to build your campsite also in areas that are not fully grown with ferns and weeds and grasses and all these type of things. Just pick a spot like right up in front here, you know, where there's barely any vegetation and maybe consider also just removing all that kind of leaf cover here. It's not a guarantee that you will remove all the ticks because they still can crawl, but just clean it up a little and you already did a great deal. The next thing you can do is very simple. Put your trousers in your socks, like so, and make sure you wear long sleeves and close them off, maybe you, like with this kind of velcro band that I have here on my jacket. The reason why this is important is the following. If you brush a twig like so and the tick attaches to your sock or to your trousers, it has a hard time to find exposed skin where it could attach to. So it will crawl around your clothing and just up and down your body without actually getting to your body. And what you can do then is just take a break once in a while and just brush off everything in order to minimize the risk of ticks getting to your skin. What I would recommend is to do this anytime you indeed go into the backwoods in case you need to get firewood for example. Sometimes you just can't avoid that. Or if you're hiking and you're walking in grass just do it every 10 to 15 minutes. Just for a short second you know doing this and that's about it. Then we also have the possibility to use chemicals to basically impregnate or yeah kind of like prepare our clothing. What I would recommend to you is permethrin. It's a toxin that you can spray onto your trousers if the tick attaches to your clothing basically. It will walk up, absorb this toxin from the fibers, it will get a neurological shock, die and drop off. The great thing about this is, not only don't you get bitten, you also kill the tick. And the less ticks the better in my opinion. Sorry but if it comes to ticks, it's always better if they die off and are just gone. What you can also do is use DEET. It's a spray you can also put on your skin. It's a little harmful to your health, yes, but nothing compared to the risks of Borreliosis or FSME, the encephalitis for example. So I would encourage you to use those remedies or those ointments and nothing else. And let me explain to you why. First of all, my apologies for the way I'm expressing myself. But a lot of people talk such an incredible bullshit out there. And I'm talking about all these kind of biological ointments and alternative remedies. And you may think of cumin, for example. There are people that think that if they eat a spoon of cumin a day, they get invincible to ticks. There is no scientific proof for that. It's esoteric stuff, you know, nothing else. There are people that claim that if you put lemon juice on your skin or certain types of mint ointments or maybe lavender, this covers up your smell and ticks won't bite. Also complete nonsense, because as I told you, there's this hollow organ that basically manages to feel different types of molecules in the air. And no perfume and no smell in or odor in the world can cover up the chemicals. You simply transpire and breathe out. Carbon dioxide is a great example for that. How do you cover this up by means of just chewing on a leaf of mint or maybe lemongrass, as people recommend? It's complete nonsense. Don't believe that and just discard that. Also look for proper sources and read about the science. If a lifestyle camping blog tells you about those so-called remedies in a five-step blog article, it's probably not right because it's not researched and it's just a blog article. So be very critical about this. 
There is one biological alternative that does work though, and this would be coconut oil. The question is why does it work? Coconut oil does contain lorinic acid, and that component is known to be repellent. And I give you a link in the description with a couple of studies and a couple of findings on a scientific level. If you find the time, just read this because it's a very interesting topic. But simply summarized, it just proves that about 80% of tick bites can be prevented. So there's a very limited effect to lorinic acid. If we take the contamination rate in my area right here, I would not use that. Because every second tick here, by means of statistic, is infested with borreliosis. So if we got 10 ticks, of which only two attach to my body, one might be infected. So it's not a certain proof and not a definitive solution for the entire tick problem here, but it can do the trick. Coconut oil can also be used for your dog, for example, just so you don't have to remove that many ticks. Give it a try, but be critical about that too. So anyway, this is about everything we can do as preventive measures. But nevertheless, we are unfortunate enough that we get a tick attaching to our arm or to whatever kind of body part of ours. What do we need to understand? First and foremost, ticks are looking for the more moist spots on your body and the dark spots, which means right behind your knee, right here in this cavity, also in your crotch, they will also very likely attach to basically your hip and your belly right where you wear your underpants and where the rubber band goes along and you might have them in your armpits or of course somewhere on your head. It's very unlikely that they attach to your back so don't panic about this. It's just too tough of a skin and it's just too unprotected for the ticks so you will barely have any ticks on your back. It happens occasionally but don't panic about this. Important about this is that we need to understand those yeah, preferred spots for the tick in that sense that we need certain gear to remove that tick then. I would recommend to you to always carry a magnifying mirror or a signal mirror. Maybe you just go out into the drugstore and you buy yourself a makeup mirror. It also does the trick. So you can basically search yourself like so and remove ticks if needed. Get a proper pair of tweezers, which means very thin and very pointy with a good grip. You will find those tweezers in any drugstore or maybe in your regular med kit also, because you should carry that anyway in order to remove splinters from your fingers or from other body parts. And they will also do a great job in removing ticks. About the tick removal as such, please never, never and never use any kind of ointments while removing the tick. There are videos out there of people using kind of menthol type of ointments to drown the tick in a drop of that ointment and then the tick releases its bite and crawls away from the, the spot where it was attaching to. It is one of the most stupid ideas ever. Sorry to say so, again pardon my language, but what you're basically doing is, again, drowning the tick and it, this triggers a panic reaction. Picture yourself being pushed underwater and you can't get up. You would also panic. And what happens is you get into a stress level that is not healthy and so with the tick. The tick then basically could vomit into your wound and by that just put out all those contaminants and pathogens that are harmful to your health. So it's a really stupid idea to use these kind of drops. The same counts for fire. There are people that use matches and try to burn the tick so it releases its grip. Very stupid idea. Imagine yourself being in flames. Panic reaction, right? Don't do this. Get a pair of tweezers and just pull them out slowly. Without twisting, just putting them as close to the skin as you can and slowly pulling them out up until they automatically release. In this way, you also will not break off the mouthpieces of that animal. Because some people also think that you would need to twist them clockwise or counterclockwise because they are screwed in. That's not true. 
the mouthpieces have barbs that just stick out to the sides. There's nothing to screw off. It's not like you have like a metal screw in your arm and you can just undo that by twisting and turning. You might even tear off the mouthpieces and hence increase the risk of infection. Again, just take them and pull them out. You could also use those tick cards that they sell at drugstores, for example. I personally don't use them because I find it rather unhandy if I would have to go right there in my crotch or so to remove the tick. The tweezers are just so thin that I can basically get to every point. Also, for example, behind the ears or such. So I would just stick with that. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking if there's something more to add. Well, one thing is really important, of course, the checkup. I didn't mention this before. Make sure you're going to check your body at least one time a day. I would do it twice after standing up and before going to bed. Simply because if you don't find the tick, you increase the risk of being contaminated. And the reason being this, the infection time, or it's not really the incubation time, but the time up until you get infested with a certain contaminant, is between 6 hours and 24 hours. Don't let people tell you you got at least a day. It depends on the tick, your immune system and different other factors. But usually you will be infected or the tick will release the pathogen in between 6 to 24 hours after attaching to your skin. So you got a lot of time. If we assume that the daytime is 12 hours just for your illustration and you do it in the early morning and you do it somewhere throughout the day, maybe, then you can cover this in six hour increments. So you're already pretty safe. What's also really important, if you remove the tick, don't kill it. I know I just said that it's important to kill the tick so they can't reproduce, but if you remove it, I would catalog it. I always have a tiny notebook with me and a bit of tape. And I'm just taping it into that book and I'm writing down the location on my body where I found the tick, the date, the time I removed it, and I also note the state if I'm absolutely sure that it's either a nymph or an adult or whatever kind of stage. The reason for that is, if I go see a doctor, I can give the tick to the doctor so they can do analysis of the tick's tissue and see if it was contaminated or not. This is really important because people think that, for example, with a borreliosis infection, you always develop that famous red circle. In about 20 cases of infections, this is not the case. Like 20% of all Borreliosis infections are left unnoticed up until you develop symptoms weeks after. So it's always good to have that tick and to be able to do proper tests on that very specimen to see if it was infested and then apply the treatment early before you have any sort of negative effect. Also, if you remove a tick, I would recommend you just go to the doctor afterwards. Just do it as a preventive measure. Stay safe. Well, I think that covers everything for so far. And I hope you could learn something of that. Really take this topic seriously. Make sure you take the proper measures. And please let me also know thoughts in the comments below. Like if you have another tip or something that you would like to share. Let's talk about this, okay? And besides that, I would just say have a nice time outdoors. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you also very much for your time because this was a long video. Please make sure that you subscribe and give a thumbs up if you like this kind of content. If you want to see something else or something in addition to this, also let me know in the comments. We can talk about everything. And up until then, I wish you a nice time outdoors. Have a great day and see you next time. Bye bye.